Welcome to this next video in the playlist on group theory. In this video, what we're going to study is p-groups. Okay, so firstly, let me just remind you of the definition of a p-group. Okay, so a p-group, often denoted capital P as opposed to capital G, is quite simply a group where the order is a prime number, a certain prime natural number, so 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, etc. Okay, which I'll denote little p, so it's just some arbitrary prime natural number to a certain power little a, where little a is a natural number, so a counting number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, etc. Okay, so that is the definition of a p group. It's just a group where the number of elements in the group, i.e., the order of the group, is some prime number to a certain power. Okay, and note that this cannot be zero. Okay, you can't, uh, you wouldn't refer to a group of order one as a p group. Okay, it must be uh, one or greater. Okay, right. So there's a reminder of the definition of a p-group. Now, uh, in previous videos in the playlist on group theory, we have studied, for instance, groups of order p-squared. Those were all p-groups. Okay, that was a specific type uh, of p-groups, a specific class of p-groups, where a, of course, was equal to 2. Okay, and we drew uh, overall an incredible conclusion there that there were only two isomorphism classes of groups uh, of a order a prime squared, uh, namely the cyclic group uh, on the set of a prime squared number of elements, and the group that you would get by direct producting the cyclic group of order p with the cyclic group of order p. Okay, um, what we're going to study in this video is theorems that will be correct for arbitrary p groups, so all p groups any group of order a prime natural number to a power, okay, rather than just uh, groups of order a prime squared. Okay, right. Now, why do we actually want to do this? What's the point of studying p-groups? Well, in this video, we're not actually going to see any incredible theorems. We're going to see a lot of little interesting theorems, uh, but no incredible groundbreaking theorems. And that's because this video is really going to be setting the stage for future videos which are going to have incredible theorems. Okay, so let me sort of try and give you the motivation for why p-groups are of interest to us. The reason really is that we've now seen Cauchy's theorem and the Seelov theorems in previous videos in the uh, playlist on group theory. And both of those theorems tell us about the existence of p subgroups, subgroups which are p groups in arbitrary groups that aren't necessarily p groups. Okay, so it might be worthwhile, and indeed it is worthwhile, to study p groups and see what conclusions we can draw about p groups um, in general, because it might then give us insight into, for instance, Seelov p subgroups, and we can use Seelov p subgroups to gain insight into arbitrary groups. Okay, so there's the motivation for having an entire video just studying theorems that hold true for p-groups. Okay, so without further ado, let's actually begin our first theorem. So overall, we're going to have five theorems, okay, which are gradually going to build on one another. Okay, so theorem one, then, is a theorem that we actually prove in the video on groups of order p-squared about arbitrary p-groups that we needed uh, for that video. But I'm going to prove it again here uh, because it is important. Uh, so I'm not going to assume that you can remember the proof from there. Okay, so theorem one then is that if you consider the centre of a p-group, which, of course, is a subgroup of any group. For any group, you can always construct the centre of that group, which, remember, by definition, is just all of the elements in that group, so all little g is an element of capital P, such that these elements commute with all other elements, so g composed with s must equal s composed with g, for all s is an element of capital P. Okay, so you put all of the elements that commute with every other element into this subset, and that forms always a subgroup of your uh, group, uh, and that's called the centre of the group. Okay, so for our p-group, we can construct the centre of uh, the group. 
Now the centre of the group is, as I say, always a subgroup, so at the very least it will be the trivial subgroup, i.e. it will contain the identity element and nothing else. However, in the context of p-groups, I claim that you can conclude instantly that the centre of a p-group is not um, the trivial subgroup. Okay, and that's what theorem 1 is really going to be all about. So theorem 1 is the claim that the centre of a p-group is never equal to the trivial subgroup, which I'll denote as uh, 1 here. Okay, it always contains a non-identity element. There is always at least uh, one interesting element, one non-identity element in the centre of a p-group. That is what theorem 1 uh, is going to be. Okay, right, so how are we going to actually prove this? Well, the way that we're going to prove this is that the order of the centre of a p-group cannot equal 1. If I can prove that, then of course I know then that the centre of the p-group cannot equal the trivial subgroup, because the centre of if the centre of the p-group was the trivial subgroup, then of course its order would be equal to 1. So by proving that its order cannot be equal to 1, I can prove that it cannot be equal to the trivial subgroup of my p-group. Okay, so that's my strategy in proving uh, theorem 1. Okay, so now, of course, I need to um, spell out the strategy for proving that the centre of the p-group uh, does not have order 1. And for that, we're going to use the class equation. Now, remember, the class equation is all about the conjugacy classes that any group uh, can be partitioned up into in a well-defined way. Okay, so uh, conjugacy classes one of the natural ways in which they come around is uh, thinking about the group action where you have all of the elements of the group acting on the set that is the group itself. Okay, so I'm just remind you of this group action here. So here I am drawing a group action composition table. Okay, and of course um, the set and the group are going to be the same thing in this case. Um, but down on the uh, left here in the uh, titles for all of the rows here, I will put all of the elements of the group, and these will be the elements of the group that are actually doing the acting, okay? Whereas up here, in the title for all of the columns, again, I will put all the elements of the group, but in this context, all the elements of the group are just elements of a set now, okay? So this is the actual group, if you like, whereas this is just the set of the group, okay? And the way we'll define this is any element of the group will act on another element of the group, but this is an element of the group just in the context of the group being viewed as a set, uh, to send it onto that element of the group, little s, conjugated by g, so g, s, g inverse. So looking at this in terms of the table, what you do is, if you wanted to work out what g dot s was, um, you would of course take the row dedicated to little g here, Okay, you take the column dedicated to little s, and this entry here, this would tell you what g dot s is, and now I'm defining you how to, um, well, I'm telling you how to actually fill in this table. You will just put in the answer as uh, g s, g inverse, which of course is something you can work out. So any of these elements uh, in here will uh, be workoutable. You can, you can now, with this rule, go forth and build this table. Okay, right. And indeed, this does obey the axioms of a group action. So all the entries are, of course, going to be back within the set that is the group. Okay, so that's looking good. Uh, and it will be compatible with the composition law that on the group. And in addition, the second axiom of a group action uh, is that uh, the identity element must act on all the other elements of the group to send them onto themselves. Of course, the identity will conjugate anything just to send it onto itself. So indeed, an arbitrary S will be sent onto itself by the identity element. So it will correspond to the identity permutation of the set that is the group in this case. Okay, so all elements of the group can be uh, interpreted as representing these set permutations of the group where you just send all the elements of the group onto um, what uh, they are after conjugation by the element of the group that's acting on them. And of course we know that these maps actually are these inner automorphisms that correspond to each element of the group. Okay, right. So now, what we can do then is we can uh, use this group action to partition the group up into the orbits of this group action. Okay, so the group 
uh, being viewed as a set in this group action can now be partitioned up into orbits. Okay, so I'll draw the group over here and we'll then partition it up into uh, orbits. Now, some of the elements of the group are actually going to end up in orbits of size 1. They're going to end up in orbits on their own, and those are the elements that are in the centre of the group. Okay, so if you're in the centre of the group, then you commute with anything, and therefore, if you conjugate an element of the centre of the group by whatever element of the group you like, okay, so let's consider G, S, G inverse then, when S is an element of the centre, so let's say S is an element of the centre, well now it commutes with all other elements of the group, so you can just swap around the S and the G here, okay, so this is equal to S, G, G inverse, and of course now G and G inverse will uh, cancel, of course we're applying associativity here, but I'm assuming that uh, you're familiar enough with group theory now that you don't need me to put the brackets in here and you're, you know associativity holds, we don't need to worry about brackets. So the G and the G inverse will cancel to give the identity and the identity composed with S will just give S back again. Okay, so indeed any element at the centre of the group when conjugated by whatever you like is just going to be um, taken onto itself, and therefore all the elements of the centre of the group will exist in orbits by themselves, because whatever element of the group acts on them, they're just going to be sent onto themselves, so their orbits truly are uh, just themselves. Okay, so I'll draw these little orbits here, which are supposed to be all of the elements of the centre of the group, and by the way, let me return to denoting this capital P, okay, and I denoted it capital G here, okay, that was just because this um, conjugation group action applies to an arbitrary group, but of course we are working with our P group, uh, so let's keep uh, that in mind, so we'll keep this as capital P here, and all of this bit then, where the conjugacy classes are these very small uh, conjugacy classes that just contain a single element, this is all the elements at the centre of this P group. Okay, uh, and obviously I've drawn it having more than one element, but that's still to be proved. We need to prove that uh, there's not just going to be one of these with the identity in. Then there will be the more interesting conjugacy classes, okay, which will be larger. They'll contain more elements, so these will be the elements that are not in the centre of the group, okay, and therefore can be turned into other elements by being conjugated by elements of the group. Okay, so let's say here then uh, are some of these non-trivial conjugacy classes. Okay, right, and what the class equation very simply tells us is that the order of the entire group is just the order of the centre of the group, okay, which is how many elements do you have in all of this bit, plus the orders of all of the non-trivial conjugacy classes, so the order of what we will denote the conjugacy class of GI, okay, so when I put CGI, this means the conjugacy class containing a GI, okay, so if I put G1, let's say G1 is a representative of this conjugacy class, this would be uh, CG1, whoops, I put CGI, CG1 here, which is um, the conjugacy class that contains G1, okay, and then you'll sum this over I is equal to 1, so let's say R, and we'll say G1, G2, all the way up to GR are representatives of the non-trivial conjugacy classes. So let's say this conjugacy class has G1 in it, this one has G2 in it, this one has G3 in it, this one has G4 in it, this one has G5 in it, and you'd go on. And of course in this case, how many do we have? We'll have 10 overall, uh, so R would be 10 here, but in more general case, you might have an arbitrary many, and that's why I put R here. Okay, right. Uh, so you add up the orders of all of these non-trivial conjugacy classes, so you just take a representative from each of the conjugacy classes to name the conjugacy class after. Okay, and that's what these G1, G2, all the way up to GR uh, are. Okay, they're just representatives of each of the non-trivial conjugacy classes. You need one representative from each of them, okay, just to name them. Uh, and then if you add up all of those orders, plus the order of the centre of the group, then of course you will get the order of the entire group. Okay, right. Uh, so this applies for any group. This equation is true for any group. Where does the interesting bit that forces the order of the centre of the group not to equal 1 come in when we're talking about P groups? Okay, well this is it. The order of a P group is going to be this prime to the power of A. Okay? Um, so a multiple of P is the key thing here. 
if I can now prove that this thing is a multiple of p, i.e. if you sum all of the orders of the non-trivial conjugacy classes up, then you get some multiple of p, then I would know that this was not equal to 1, because if it was equal to 1, then I'd be adding 1 onto a multiple of p, and I would not get a multiple of p. When you take a multiple of p and add 1 onto it, you do not suddenly end up uh, with the overall answer being a multiple of p again. You end up with something that's not a multiple of p. So if this was a multiple of p, we know this is a multiple of p, then it would show that this could not equal 1. It would have to be a multiple of p, basically. Okay, so it would have to, at the very least, be equal to p. Okay, so hence uh, the centre of this p group would not be the trivial subgroup. Okay, so all I now need to argue is why the sum of the orders of all of these non-trivial conjugacy classes is going to be a multiple of p. Well, this is very simple. I claim that the orders of all of these conjugacy classes, these non-trivial conjugacy classes themselves are multiples of p. And of course, when you add up loads of multiples of p, you're still going to end up with a multiple of p. So why can I say that the order of a non-trivial conjugacy class is a multiple of p? Well, of course, the order of a conjugacy class has to divide the order of the group. Okay, let me just remind you the reason for that. The reason comes from the orbit stabilizer theorem. The orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that the size of one of these orbits, okay, so the size of a conjugacy class of GI, times the size of the stabilizer of this element. Now, what will the stabilizer of one of these elements be? Well, of course, it will be all the elements of the group, which, if you use them to conjugate GI, give you GI back again. That's the definition of the centralizer of GI in P, denoted like so. So, C for centralizer of GI in P is how you would read this. Okay, so the, remember, the definition of this is just all the elements, so all little g is an element of capital P, such that, I'll just move this up, such that when you use little g to conjugate little gi, so if you take g, gi, g inverse, the answer is little gi here. Okay, so it's all the elements of the group, uh, which if they are used to conjugate this specific element here, give that element as the answer back again. Okay, so indeed this is the stabilizer of that element under this group action. And the orbit stabilizer theorem tells us that if you take the size of an orbit of an element and times it by the size of the stabilizer of that element, you get overall uh, the size of the group that is acting on the set, i.e. the order of p. And of course this is equal to p to the power of a. Now, uh, we, well, <laughs> that now means that the order of the centralizer of gi has to be a multiple of pa. Okay, so it can be 1 or it can be a power of p. Now, it's not going to equal 1 because this is supposed to be a non-trivial conjugacy class. It's supposed to contain more than just one element, okay, and therefore it must be a multiple of p. Okay, so all of the orders of these non-trivial conjugacy classes then are going to be powers of p, and therefore when you add up all of their orders, you're overall going to get a multiple of p. Okay, so this is all a multiple of p. Okay, so that then proves this cannot be equal to 1, because if we know this is a multiple of p, if you add 1 onto a multiple of p, you do not suddenly get a multiple of p back again, which we know you have to. Okay, hence this also has to be a multiple of p, uh, so at the very least it must equal little p. Okay, so any p group then must have a non-trivial centre. The centre of the group contains more elements than just the identity element. You can always find a non-identity element which commutes with all other elements if you are working within a p-group. That is theorem 1. Okay, so we'll have a break here, and in the next video, we'll prove another interesting theorem about p-groups.